Antarctic is an incredibly unique area of the world and it's a little bit like the, the edge of the world. We have so many species here gathering in the summer that either migrated here to feed or live here all year round. I grew up in Shetland and uh, that's North Shetland so now I'm standing in the South Shetland Islands and when I was a kid I did a lot of wandering around in the hills and I used to spend a lot of time standing on the top of the cliffs and looking out to sea thinking right okay I know what my mission is in life I need to work to preserve the oceans and I do need to work in conservation and that's what makes sense to me and that's kind of why I became a biologist and that's why I work and as a marine scientist on ocean protection. We are in the Antarctic as a part of a one year long expedition from pole to pole. Uh, we started the ship tour in the Arctic uh, last year and we are ending it in Antarctic now. The aim of the ship tour is to highlight the importance of marine protected areas uh, and the fact that high seas in the world are not protected. I come from the Arctic, uh, that's where I'm born and that's where I live and I think it makes me somehow emotionally attached to the Antarctic as well. To see all this wildlife, it's touching in a good way uh, but also touching in a sad way when you realize all the threats that the species here and the whole area are facing. Unfortunately, there are many threats facing Antarctic species from the changing environment due to climate change to marine litter, plastics, poor fisheries management, etc. And that's why we're hoping to contribute some really robust scientific data on species diversity monitoring. And that will enable scientists and ourselves to be able to monitor these areas in future to see if, if we can detect any changes and their populations or distributions. We have quite a varied program for sampling in the different areas that we're visiting in sunrise. So we, already we've been collecting plankton samples, so phytoplankton, some emerging evidence to suggest that in the areas where the glaciers are melting and the seawater is becoming more fresher, so the salinity is dropping, plankton health is being disturbed by climate change that can change overall ecosystem functioning because plankton is the base of the food chain. What we're doing here is quite pioneering in a way in that we are sampling in a different way that no one else has really done before. We're using eDNA methods in the open oceans, a specific technique to estimate biodiversity right across the West Antarctic Peninsula. Take your waypoint, please. eDNA stands for environmental DNA and this is DNA that's been left behind animals or plants in the environment. As an animal well, passes through this area that where we're sampling, it leaves behind, it sheds skin, mucus, poo, whatever it is that it's, it's left from its body, and we will hopefully collect it on our filter and get an estimate of species richness in this particular area. The beauty of eDNA monitoring is that it's a fairly non-invasive technique, so we're able to complete these transects using the ribs and this means that we don't have to use a lot of manpower, a lot of specialist equipment and we're able to do this eDNA monitoring fairly quickly without disturbing any other wildlife in this incredibly unique environment. We've also managed to sample at depths and that gives a, a different signal of what species might be living at deeper waters and at the surface. At the moment we are close to Dundee Island in the Antarctic Sound and we're aiming to take a water sample between 200 and 300 meters depth and that water sample we're going to test for eDNA. 285. We have two Niskin bottles which can then go right down to just above the seabed and they're going to collect 10 liters of water each when we trip them with a messenger that we send down the line and that should give us a sample right down at depth. For each day we've had two or three launches of the boats. That has meant that the whole crew has had to be involved in this work. It can be a beautiful day, but also we've been sampling out in uh, four sevens. 
where it's been windy and snowy and really, really rough. It's been an incredible success because everyone is hugely motivated, they all care about the, the oceans and they're really, really highly skilled. I work on board Arctic Sunrise as a logistics coordinator. Uh, that means that I'm working with practical things around, for example, the scientific sampling that we're doing, uh, trying to match it with other things that we need to do. It's quite a lot about like coordinating which boats go where, trying to help uh, the science work as much as possible. Anything from cleaning penguin poop from the rubber boots into uh, making daily schedules. I, I've never seen whales um, this this close by. Uh, I've never seen this many whales in my whole life, and I think it's just really touching to hear the whale just hear it breathe. But at the same time, it's quite a sad thought when you realize that these areas are not protected. What is done in other parts of the world uh, can be seen here when it comes to pollution, different chemicals. Uh, we have had already for some years been taking samples with microfibers or microplastics, even like the PFAs, it's the chemical compounds that are used in uh, waterproofing, for example, outdoor gear. Um, and that's something that we have also found in this pristine environment. You would think that this area is pristine and you would think that in a, such a small volume of seawater, like two and a half litres, you know, it should be clean. Yet, previous work by Greenpeace has shown that there are microfibers within these waters. And all of that is to do with human activities from really far away places, yet it's still impacting in areas here. So a lot of humpback whales that have been observed from the ship feeding and when we can we've been launching boats and trying to collect as much data on these whales. Um, collecting photo ID data and marking the position of sightings when we have an encounter with any whale or dolphin species. The humpback whales are great to study because they have quite individual um, tail flukes uh, colorings. So you can see from in here where their tail flukes, flukes look quite different for different animals. It's a bit like a fingerprint. You can see here there is damage on the trailing edge here, like a big notch on the trailing edge. And of course the black and white patterning can be different. And for instance in this individual here, these stripes here, scratches, are from killer whale tooth rake marks. So that animal may well have been attacked previously and managed to escape. We've also been working on passive acoustic monitoring of cetaceans, so using hydrophones to listen for cetaceans, whales and dolphins. We have a toad array, which is a hydrophone that we're deploying from the after the ship whilst we're completing any passages, so we've been monitoring cetaceans right throughout the Drake Passage and throughout the rest of the areas that we're visiting in Antarctic. We'll be able to classify the animals, hopefully to species level, that gives us an idea of the distribution of those animals. So we can send out a boat to do some photo ID and uh, uh, more close sound recordings and collect uh, DNA samples to build up a better picture. You can find them southeast, well mine. Okay, I am on southeast course. Oh, look, there it is. Just off the bow. Oh, I see, I see them. Transiting down the Gurlash, we really quickly launched the ribs. We dropped the hydrophone down, turned the engine off. We were sitting really quietly and calmly with the hydrophone listening and recording. And these two whales came right up to the boat, approached us, and were quite interested in us for a few minutes. To be able to see whales at close quarters is such a privilege. You very rarely the people on the planet have that ability to see whales like that.
at times we then get data back saying, oh, your, that your whale's been seen in another area. And that helps us understand the direct sort of migratory link between these feeding areas and breeding areas. We photographed a whale in Paradise Harbour on January 20th, 2020. And previously, the first time that that whale was ever photographed was actually in 2012 off the coast of Panama in the Pacific. So that really shows a direct linkage between the uh, breeding grounds in Panama and West Antarctic Peninsula. There's no way that you can protect any sort of species and habitats if you're not thinking about the bigger picture. And humpback whales is a really good example of why we need to protect not just small areas of the oceans, but also much wider, larger areas. So we really need to look at global ocean protection as much more of a holistic view, and we really need to make sure that all of those areas are protected and not we don't leave these animals or habitats vulnerable. We're at Esperanza Station in Antarctica, and it was only yesterday that they recorded the highest ever temperature on the base here. And at this meteorological station, I'm just standing beside, and it's a really sobering thought to think that this whole area is gonna change. People working in this station uh, now, who have been here 10 years ago, they always say that the, the temperature, the, the view was completely uh, different. For example, the glacier was very uh, close to the, to the station. Now you can observe very far. Nowadays it's completely different and you can see the sediment of the glacier, yes. And there are some, I don't know, caverns in, on the glacier and with the water um, like a fall, yes. What is this going to do to the whole ecosystem? I find that quite uh, such a concern because you know that it's such a special habitat on our planet. that you know, is, is important for so many different species that come down here in the summer to feed and to breed. Yeah, it's shocking to see that it's changing so fast. It just doesn't seem like a frozen continent should no, be that No, 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 no. The whole food chain down here is built on krill. So the whales, the seals, the penguins, everything is eating krill and nothing but krill all summer long. The main theory right now is that climate change is affecting this area and that's having effects on the whole ecosystem, probably from the ground up. We did an island-wide survey of Elephant Island which hadn't been done in 50 years. And we found that the chin straps on Elephant Island have dropped in that 50 year span by more than 50%. So there are way fewer chin straps than there were even in the 70s. We can already see here how, how hard we humans are making it for the species to survive here. Not only because of climate change, but because of the plastic pollution. I mean, you can find trash on these shores, but also krill fishing, all other industrial activities. They are hitting these areas really fast and really hard. Looking at how the oceans have changed over the last sort of 25 years, we've got a long way to go. And when it comes to making policy decisions, we really need to put conservation first and have that as a priority, not just as a moral priority, but also because actually as humans we need to have healthy functioning oceans for food security, for climate change mitigation, for our well-being. So I don't see that we quite really learned from our mistakes previously. And so I think it's about time we did really. It's time we um, put conservation first.